India has one of the finest traditions of painting of the ancient world. These paintings are born out of the deep philosophy of the land and they express the gentlest thoughts of mankind. From the 2nd century BC till the 5th century AD, some of the most beautiful blossoms of the art of man flowered in the Sahyadri hills of western India. Here, amid the abundant beauty of nature, two streams met. The compassionate philosophy of the Buddha and the refined art of exquisite painting. These streams came together to create a body of paintings which became the fountainhead of the art of a whole continent. Painted across the walls of the Ajanta Caves are the images of Bodhisattvas, gentle seekers of truth. Amid all the turbulence of the material world, we are taken to a peaceful sanctuary. These graceful beings look within. The contemporaneous cave sites of Pital Khora, Badami and Bagh in Maharashtra, Karnataka and Madhya Pradesh reflect the gentle traditions of Ajanta. The 6th century murals of Badami are the earliest surviving paintings of the Hindu tradition. In Tamil Nadu, the 7th century Shaivite paintings of the Kailashnath temple at Kanchipuram display the continuation of the classic tradition of Indian art. There is a new sense of ornamentation and grandeur which begins in these paintings made during the rule of the Pallavas. This culminates in the grand visions upon the walls of the great Chola temple of Brihadishwar at Tanjabur. This temple to the great Lord Shiv was made by King Rajaraj Chola to celebrate the magnificence of his empire. The murals in the narrow inner ambulatory of the temple stretch 20 feet above us and convey the imperial stature and the military vision of the great ruler. In Indian paintings, these are the earliest surviving images of Shiv in his wrathful form as Tripurantak and performing the cosmic dance as Nataraj. In the meanwhile, in the 9th century, exquisite Jain paintings were being made in the caves of Sittanevasal in Tamil Nadu and Ellora in Maharashtra. The lotus pond painted on the ceiling of the cave at Sittanevasal embodies the deepest sense of the joy and harmony of the whole of creation. In the paintings of Ellora, also of the 9th century, we see the continuation of the tradition of Ajanta as well as the first glimmerings of a style which was to spread throughout the country in the centuries to come. There is a sense of angular movement and we see the protrusion of the further eye beyond the line of the face. In the meantime, in the plains of eastern India, the Nalanda and Vikramshila universities had become great centers of learning. 
pilgrims and scholars from distant lands crossed formidable geographical barriers to come here to study. Only a fragment survives of what must have been the glorious mural paintings of Nalanda. The deep philosophy of Vajrayan Buddhism, which was to spread across most of Asia, was created in these universities. This form of Buddhism gave great importance to the art of painting. It was believed that the worshipper imbibed the qualities of the Buddha by meditating upon images of his many manifestations. Here in the Pala Kingdom of Eastern India, exquisite paintings were made in large numbers on Buddhist palm leaf manuscripts. The gentle essence and the lilting grace of the Ajanta murals are captured in the narrow spaces of these delicate folios. In the early 11th century, King Yeshe O of Guge invited Kashmiri artists to paint the walls of 108 Buddhist monasteries which he constructed across the Trans Himalayas in Ladakh, Lahol Spiti and Western Tibet. Most of these murals have perished with the passage of time. Those that survive in isolated monasteries in Ladakh and Lahol Spiti are among the most magnificent ever painted. They reflect a blending of the classic tradition of Indian painting and the diverse cultural influences coming on the trade routes from Central Asia and China. These paintings have the skilled modeling of form and sense of volume of the classic tradition. They also display the protruding further eye which had by then become a norm in painting all over the subcontinent. The 11th and 12th centuries saw repeated foreign invasions across the plains of India. The monasteries of Nalanda and Vikramshila were destroyed. The art of mural painting was disrupted in the Indo-Gangetic plains and learned monks and scholars fled to nearby Nepal, taking with them their valued manuscripts and paintings. Thereafter, the art of Buddhist paintings was preserved in the Himalayan regions. Jainism flourished in India at the same time as Buddhism. Besides Buddhist paintings, the other great stream of paintings which flowed in India through many centuries was that of the Jains. Large numbers of painted manuscripts were made for the Jain faith. In the 10th and 11th century Jain manuscript paintings, we see both the naturalistic Pala style and the linear style of the Jains. But slowly the linear tradition with its angular abstractions became the norm. The introduction of paper in the 14th century as the popular base for paintings led to changes in the style. Earlier, the compositions had been strictly horizontal owing to the restrictive narrow shape of the palm leaf. Now, the artist had a larger surface to work on. Stylizations and conventions were developed and used extensively in the Jain paintings. Linear draftsmanship defines the forms. Color is applied in flat washes. 
The stylized human figures with pointed noses and rounded chins resemble those at Elora. The protruding eye, extending beyond the line of the face, adds to the vitality of these paintings. This style has come to be known as the Western Indian style of painting. In the early medieval period, with the fading of the classical style in Indian painting, this style became dominant across all of India. We see the protruding further eye in paintings as diverse as those in the Buddhist monasteries of Ladakh and in the Hindu temples of the Vijayanagar Empire. Of the 13th century, there is only one surviving fragment of a mural painting in North India. This is on the ceiling of the Choti Kacheri temple in the Lalitpur district of Uttar Pradesh. The art of mural painting revived after a long gap with the establishment of the great Vijayanagar Empire in the 14th century. Vijayanagar, or the city of victory, was a proud and prosperous empire with its capital at the great city of Hampi in present-day Karnataka. The paintings on the ceilings of the magnificent Virupaksh temple at Hampi and the great temple at Lepakshi display a rare vigour and beauty. These murals show the continuation of the Western Indian style of painting in their angular features and in the depiction of the protruding further eye. The rich variety of textiles depicted in these paintings reflects the flourishing cosmopolitan culture of the Vijayanagar Empire. The end of the 15th century saw the establishment of five Deccani kingdoms of Ahmednagar, Bijapur, Golconda, Bidar and Berar. These kingdoms maintained strong links with Persia. The Deccani Sultanates became great centers of art and the meeting place of two cultures. The Sufis who came from Persia believed in a deeply personal love for the Lord. This was very similar to the thoughts of the Bhakti movement which prevailed in India from the 12th century onwards. Both believed in single-minded devotion to the Lord and spoke of the soul's yearning to be reunited with God. Exquisite paintings were the result of this confluence of cultures. The Deccani paintings transport us into a world of gentleness and magical fantasy. In early Deccani paintings, we do not see scenes of violence and war, or the pomp and grandeur of royal courts. These paintings are sublime, and they remind us of the deep and inward look of the art of ancient times. Meanwhile, in the north of India, the Mughal Empire was founded in 1526 by Babur. His dynasty became one of the greatest the world had seen. The culture and the art they created helped to shape future developments in all spheres of life in the Indian subcontinent. Akbar who came to the Mughal throne in 1556, 
was one of the most remarkable men in history. He was an enlightened man and ruler and was responsible for innovations in every sphere of life. Under Akbar and his successors, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, a remarkable school of painting was created. This was a major landmark in the history and development of painting in India. The Mughal school became a great crucible of talents. It brought together the influences of the many styles of painting which developed in different parts of India. These were combined with the grace and delicacy which came from the tradition of the Persian painters in the Mughal court. The emphasis was now on the documentation of the world around. Portraits began to be made in large numbers. Rulers were made in their courts and out on hunts with their noblemen. For the first time in India, the world around, the here and now, formed the subject of paintings. Mughal paintings brought a new sense of refinement and jewel-like perfection to the tradition of Indian painting. The influence of the Mughal school spread throughout the land and significantly shaped the future development of paintings in India. In the meanwhile, Rajasthani paintings had continued the styles which were developed in the Western Indian tradition of painting. The liveliness and vivid colours of the earlier idiom are to be seen in the paintings of the Chor Panchashika style and in the vibrant early paintings of Malva and Mevar. These paintings are marked by essentially simple compositions and brilliant colours. Gradually the many kingdoms of Rajasthan developed schools of painting, each with a distinct flavour and style. These paintings were also deeply influenced by the imperial Mughal style of painting. Many Rajput chieftains and princes went into the hills of present-day Himachal Pradesh and set up ateliers of painting there. The styles of Rajasthani paintings were carried to these courts. In the verdant surroundings of Kangra, Basohli and other hill states, the spirit of the artists took wings. In these Pahari paintings, we see again the depth of compassion and sense of the great harmony of the whole world, which was seen in the ancient paintings. There is in these lyricism and joy and the unabashed love of the Lord. Again, here is a school of painting which takes us far away from the fretful concerns of the material world. Vasco da Gama reached the shores of Calicut in 1498 and a new chapter opened in the history of India. Over the next two centuries, European influence came into every sphere of life, from politics to art. By the end of the 18th century, the British Empire dominated most of the subcontinent. Indian rulers and nobles looked towards the British to emulate their ways. In the 18th and 19th centuries, the continuing tradition of painting from ancient times was disrupted. 
the new European patrons retained their strong sense of identity with the land they came from. And they wished to have paintings of Indian subjects to show back home. They also wished to document the customs and manners of the diverse range of Indian people so as to better understand them, to govern them effectively. Indian painters adapted their talents to suit the tastes of the new patrons. Art schools were set up to teach Indian artists to paint according to the norms of the Western academic style. A new generation of Indian painters was trained in oil painting and this style of realism. In the second half of the 19th century, Raja Ravi Varma excelled in oil painting in the academic style. He went back to the traditional epic and divine themes of the past. He painted gods and goddesses in a highly realistic manner, which was found appealing. By the end of the 19th century, Abhinendranath Tagore and others in Calcutta rejected the Western methods of art education and instead created an Indian language in art. The Bengal school produced large numbers of paintings which hark back to ancient and medieval Indian traditions of painting. In times to come, many regarded the Bengal school as sentimental. However, it marked a significant break from the following only of the Western norms and academic style in painting. By the 1930s and 40s, Amrita Shergil and other painters attempted to synthesize two modes of perception. They wished to infuse an Indian spirit into their art and yet create a modern idiom in painting. In 1947, India won its freedom from colonial rule to become an independent nation. The search for a truly modern Indian identity continued for Indian painters. They had a rich heritage of art and philosophy coming to them from ancient times. However, this tradition had been fractured over a few hundred years. The last 50 years have been marked by a great endeavour of the Indian artist to find his roots again. To formulate an artistic idiom for modern India, which inherits past traditions and is also relevant to the concerns of contemporary society. The 20th century has seen the rise of the individual. For the Indian artist, it has been a lonely journey. Society no longer provides the collective support which stems from a shared sense of harmony of the world. The focus has been much more on the individual and his personal quest to discover what is relevant and true. In the Indian tradition, art has always had a preeminent position. Paintings have been considered to be one of the greatest treasures of mankind. We have a living tradition of over 2,000 years of painting in this land. It has been a marvellous journey through these centuries. Indian art has absorbed fine influences which have come from other cultures. 
Yet, it has retained a distinct identity which is deeply rooted in the eternal philosophy of India.